Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my name's Ken Catchpole, um, and uh, unfortunately I haven't been able to make it to Germany, but, uh, but Tanya and I discussed what I could do to, do, to, to, to talk with you a little about um, some of my ideas around behavioural interventions um, in surgery. Um, so what I suggested was uh, a co controversial title, to, to, to be a little controversial, um, and what I came up with was the title, um, The End of the Beginning, is it time to forget what we think we know about behavioural interventions in surgery? And you'll see, hopefully, what I mean by that um, in a minute. Um, I hopefully, I'm going to challenge you a little bit on what you think. Some of this may, may, you may have already thought of. Um, some of it's not necessarily new. Um, some of it might be new to you. I hope some of it will be new to you. Um, and I might be wrong, but what I'm trying to do is, is you know, maybe strike up some controversy and help us to think about new ways to think. So let's... Let's delve a little deeper into that. Um, behavioural interventions assume that clinicians don't know the appropriate behaviours or communications, and that other people, such as behavioural scientists, do, uh, and that teaching clinicians or somehow changing their behaviour directly will lead them uh, to change how they behave. And I think it's appropriate, uh, an important part of a behavioural research researcher to question and challenge the, the, those assumptions. Um, firstly, let's think about the issues around causation. A lot of the justification for this sort of research, I already outlined earlier, that, that you know, a lot of the causation uh, of, 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 ac of clinical accidents is associated with communication. But if we think about causation, there's a denominator problem here. The vast majority of clinical time is spent communicating. So, of course, the vast, you know, the, the proportion of, uh, of, uh, of communication issues um, that, you know, that, that contribute to incidents would be high. Um, so, since communication is a major compu component of clinical work, it stands to reason that it would therefore be implicated in lots of patient safety incidents. If we were to take the idea that 80%, for example, of avo avoidable harm was contributed to communication problems, um, but in fact 95% of clinical work was spent communicating, actually that would suggest that you know, maybe, many, maybe communication wasn't as important um, as other aspects of clinical work. Now I don't know what that number is, but we, the truth is we don't know the denominator. So to say that communication is the biggest contributor to, uh, to uh, uh, to patient safety incidents may be true, but it may, uh, it may somewhat mislead us because such a huge proportion of, communicate, of, of, uh, of clinical work is about communication. Next, let's think about who is, who's doing the communication. Clinicians have to work in huge, geographically distributed and temporally, geographically and temporally distributed teams, which have vastly different skill sets. They might be messaging someone, uh, in another hospital while talking on the phone or re receiving a page from somewhere in their own hospital while talking face to face with a nurse or a, uh, or a doctor or another doctor or a patient or another specialist. Um, they have to work under time pressure in situations that are constantly changing. There are few teams on earth, I would argue, that have such diversity and complexity. For example, a lot of the lessons coming from the airline cockpits, uh, you know, much of that translation just, just doesn't work in this case because you've essentially on an airline, you know, on an airliner um, from, you know, the crew resource management model, you have two pilots with very, very similar training uh, and, and, a, and a crew with, you know, with relatively similar training, all actually within, you know, within a small time and space. Clinical teams are much more complex, even operating teams have an incredible, you know, much greater range of diversity. So even in traditional um, business environments where a lot of this, this sort of literature comes from, you know, again, you have often have very similar people with similar backgrounds, similar training, um, you know, relating um, in, you know, often in real time, um, but, you know, but at least towards um, uh, goals that are relatively clear. Um, so, and certainly not as morally fraught as clinical goals. And so 
Um, so we have um, you know a, a huge diversity of goals and of you know ways to achieve that. We have you know incredible moral challenges. A lot of uh, a lot of uh, discord in clinical teams comes from the fact that everyone thinks that they they care more for that patient than other people. When there's when it's a decision over money or over a business strategy, it's much easier to let go of your own views on that. Um, Whereas when, when there's a patient's life at stake and that patient might die if you don't uphold, you know, you feel that patient might die if you don't uphold a certain, uh, a certain point of view, it becomes very difficult to compromise. Um, so both the, you know, so the two areas from which our knowledge base comes from, um, the aviation model and the business arenas, I don't think, have, you know, truly encompasses the complexity and challenges uh, associated with team working in healthcare. Let's also think about what communication actually means. It's not just a set of skills. It's having a time and a place to communicate. Um, the only room an operating team are in together is the operating room. Um, and so, having a and so uh, thinking about the impacts that that has on their ability to associate with one another and, and behave, perform as a team together um, is, is really important. One of the disincentives for briefing and debriefing, which I've already said, I think it can be extremely effective, um, is the financial challenges that actually carving out five or 10 minutes of a day to, to do a briefing can be extremely difficult for these, you know, for operating teams even when they want to change their behavior to do such. Um, we need a common language to communicate in and when you have so many different specialists they all have different languages and even language itself um, can be confused such as in the very clear distinction that needs to be made between hyper and hypo. It's very extremely easy to make, uh, to make that mistake. Um, so, you know, again, all of these things are communication issues and might come up as sources of communication error, but yet would not be resolved by the uh, a behavioral approach to teamwork. Um, and actually, um, I'd argue, therefore, that maybe healthcare teams are actually incredibly high performers in teamwork and that perhaps we could learn a lot about good teamwork from these teams that we could then translate into aviation or business business management because they have to deal in you know with in such acute situations you know many different people many many different forms of communication um, you know not having a shared language not having a structure to communicate in having to communicate um, uh, in uh, you know w within within you know some very very deep financial and time constraints so maybe. It's, we're asking the wrong question. Maybe should we should be saying, what is it that these teams do well? Um, because maybe we can learn something about that that will benefit lots of other industries. Um, so when we talk about behavioral change, we want to be very careful that we're, we're, uh, we're, we're focusing on actually what's good and what's bad. Certainly we know that teams can sometimes appear to be dysfunctional or individuals don't always display the team skills that we would normally consider to be polite or effective. Um, however, much as we find it distasteful, um, do we really know that shouting at, at, at a scrub nurse or a scrub tech who hasn't got the right equipment is not going to be effective? Certainly some surgeons would argue that it is. We need to be very careful about, uh, about how we address that particular problem. I would maintain that it's probably ineffective, but, I, but that's only based on my 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 view and that might be accused of being colonialist in that I'm coming into a new situation without necessarily truly understanding the the social context in which certain behaviors happen um, and 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 as a behavioral researcher we need to be very aware of the assumptions we make uh, as far as I'm aware we haven't done that work we don't really know that shouting at a scrub nurse is not a good idea. We think we do, and we can probably offer justifications as to why that is. But, but you know, we don't, we don't always, we can't always be certain.
So what, is, what does effective teamwork behaviour look like? I think the truth is that we can make some judgments and um, we don't know. We don't know for a number of reasons. We don't know because it varies massively with context. It varies, what, what's good teamwork varies from ICU to award, from manager to clinician, you know, across different handovers, um, and indeed in different sorts of surgery. Um, and I'll, to, to illustrate why this is complex, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use, a, uh, use a clearer example. Take a task of scoring points with a team of 11 or more on a grass field with a ball. Um, successful teamwork in soccer looks very different from successful teamwork in American football or rugby or cricket, and yet they're all being performed in you know, relatively similar context in a sport, competitive sport, to score points with a team of 11 or more on a grass pitch and a ball. Um, though we can look at some of those generic tasks, you know, leadership, defined roles, you know, multiple skill sets, you know, tasks and subtasks, um, the importance of individual behaviours in each of those situations is weighted very differently. Um, so the leadership required for uh, an American football team where, you know, the quarterback and indeed the coach who isn't even off the pitch often call the plays is very different from leadership in soccer where there's where it's you know there's much more of there's less of a hierarchy actually in soccer that everyone kind of contributes in different ways and in rugby where you have a pack leader who leads the scrum and and a um, and, and a you know and a team captain um, but they the their leadership qualities and how they uh, express their leadership are very very different uh, and indeed, uh, and so and it's fair to say that a generic approach to teamwork training for each of those would not improve the performance of a soccer team uh, if they were to have the teamwork training that was also that also worked for a um, uh, for an American football team, or for a cricket team, or for a rugby team. Uh, and so, when we think about uh, teamwork and what makes good teamwork we need to understand the context in which it happens. So I'm going to use examples from the different sorts of surgery I've been involved with uh, to illustrate how this, this looks in surgery. Um, so in, in cardiac surgery, the key relationship, in, if you like, in terms of the process, is between the surgeon, the perfusionist, and the anesthesiologist. The, um, uh, because it requires that perfusion is, is shared, the management of perfusion, which is essentially the, the life support of the patient, is shared between those three individuals. What each of them do uh, affects the other one. Now, the scrub nurse um, follows what the surgeon does, and in general, the, uh, the, 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 the circulating nurse or the runner uh, follows, you know, what, uh, supports the scrub nurse. Um, and so you have other sub-teams within that, but the key is the relationship between these, those three, and I've already given two illustrations of how that can fall over, and indeed, why team steps doesn't actually address the technical complexities of that particular relationship. Interestingly, the, if you take orthopedic surgery, the key relationship there is between the, the surgeon and the scrub nurse. If you have a scrub nurse who knows the equipment extremely well and, the, uh, uh, and is, is very familiar with the Im implants, they will do much better and have a much better process and performance than a scrub nurse who doesn't. And the communication, a lot of that is nonverbal. If you like, you're reliant on the situation awareness of the scrub nurse to know when, um, when the next, uh, you know, to, to know when the next piece of equipment is going to be used and where that is within her huge numbers of trays of equipment. She might have 18 trays of equipment and know that in two minutes' time the surgeon is going to need this particular jig or, or drill bit. And so firstly, they need to know that that surgeon is going to need it. Um, and secondly, where it is um, in their tray. It's a very different sort of team skill um, than the sorts of team skills required for cardiac surgery. And indeed, in that scenario, the anesthesiologist is almost barely involved. Um, and so, again, training this team in a generic sort of team skills is not going to help, whereas the key relationship actually is in the is in the relationship between the surgeon and the scrub tech and how between them they use the equipment, the jigs and the, and the trays and the drills and, the, uh, and all the, 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 the cutting implements required 
for what is a you know for um, orthopedic surgery, which is extremely process based, and so actually doesn't need that that much communication around decision making. Certainly not in comparison to some of the more challenging cardiac surgery. The third example is with robotic surgery, where the surgeon is no longer even at the, at the operating table. And so simply changing a piece of equipment requires much more communication uh, and much more readback uh, and you know, a whole different set of skills than changing equipment, uh, than changing equipment in traditional laparoscopic surgery that, uh, that, um, that this is designed to replace. So the teamwork in each of those scenarios, based on the tasks and the technologies they're using and the, the goals they're trying to achieve, even though it's surgery, look very, very different. And so at best, you know, at least what we need to be doing is understanding the different weightings um, that we should apply, the different importance of those different skills um, on those teams. And indeed, I would argue, incorporating technology um, as part of understanding of that context and indeed as part of the training. Really what I'm saying is as we delve into um, what constitutes a team, we start to see how much influence context plays. Even, even people's roles and how well they're defined is important, but the technology can have a huge impact, the process can have a huge impact. Uh, and so we need to think really quite carefully, uh, I think, um, as we move forward in what that looks like and how we deal with that complexity. Otherwise, we're going to be left with a generic sort of um, training that doesn't really address much of anyone's particular requirement and probably isn't cost effective. I hope this has been of interest from uh, the point of view of thinking about how we might move forward with uh, better, better behavioral research, better behavioral intervention, you know, more you know, expanding on you know, the good the work that we've done, but actually in thinking much more critically about how we go forward. Um, we need to be really critical of the evidence, especially if it agrees with us. And that's a good lesson for any scientist, that we can't just say, yeah, teamwork training works. Because actually, as soon as you pick apart that idea, it very quickly, you, be, you know, well, it, it works for some things some of the time, well, something works for some things some of the time. We actually, we're not even sure what that is. Um, we need to listen to frontline staff and take very, very, you know, great care that we're not being, if you like, co colonial towards them of telling them that they should behave differently. There may well be reasons why they behave in those, you know, in those ways. Um, we need to keep having and working on meaningful interventions that work uh, and, and, and uh, be prepared to fail with those interventions. Um, uh, we need to uh, understand how, you know, how behavioral change might be affected by things other than just training. That actually, um, if we were to change processes or, or technologies or tasks, the impact that those have and that there, there might be some beneficial ways to achieve the behavioral changes that we, that we would like to achieve through ways other than training.